Mm -hmm. I'm very lucky to have uh, Dr. Julio Torres here with us, and you are currently building the linguistics lab with Dr. Judith Kroll, correct? So, I, I so, so no. No, <laughs> um, okay. No, yes, no. Um, yeah. So, Dr. Judy Kroll joined UCI Language Science Department, mm -hmm. so we are collaborating, um, mm. um, right, the language science community, we are collaborating with each other, especially those of us who do work on bilingualism, um, mm -hmm. but no, I, I, I have my independent lab, she has her independent right. lab. Um, but yeah, but there is cross, you know, interdisciplinary, right. cross-disciplinary um, right. efforts. Um, so it's a very, it's a great moment to be at UCI as a, as a language scientist, because um, there's like really these exciting projects um, emerging, these exciting collaborations. So yeah, so yeah, so I'm, I'm very lucky to work with her, obviously. Um, but yeah, but we, obviously we also have personal, professional agendas. Right. That are different. And so I kind of wanted to ask, you know, you, you have a PhD in linguistics, which is, or in an alternative language, and you obviously, obviously if you have a PhD, you could pretty much, you have the intellect to do anything you want. So why language sciences? Why not math or anything else? What drew you to this topic? Well, I don't know if you, that means that you can do any topic, right, or anything. <laughs> um, I would be very hesitant to do a PhD in that. Um, but thank you. I like that. I like that. Um, well, I think, obviously, a PhD, um, I feel, speaks a lot about your resilience, your discipline, your work ethic, right? So I don't, I, I kind of dispel this myth that you need to be this brilliant brainiac. Um, it's not necessarily so. I don't feel like I am more gifted or more intelligent than right than people out there in the world but I think it does speak to a commitment um it does speak about work ethic and right in order to achieve the PhD so right. um so yeah um so why language science well I am so from undergrad I majored in um, French and Spanish education and so I've always been interested in language I started taking French and Italian when I was in high school so and they were my favorite subjects and I kept on with French because we only had a year of Italian so I always liked language and but I started I majored I double majored first in chemistry and French in college and then I realized I did not want to work in a lab um, um, with chemicals I I'm social and I like um, interacting with people. And so, yeah, so then I changed to education. I love to teach. I've always um, liked that as well. And um, so, yeah, while I was teaching, I, 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 w I became fascinated with language learning and how my students were learning Spanish. Um, and also I was beginning to have students who were what we call heritage speakers, right? So these are kids who grew up with Spanish at home. And I realized when I was a high school teacher that um, they were not responding to instruction the same way or they, right, they, they were just not doing as well. And I, I thought that was very odd given that, they had a background resources right, right. Um, into the classroom so um so the, the, i had made these observations but you know going you know doing my thing teaching um and then we in my department we were redesigning curriculum mm -hmm. um and at the time i was department chair i was department chair for two years at the school district where i taught and what i realized when i started looking at research from second language acquisition that should have informed our curriculum design i did not understand it nor had i ever heard of it. Um, so I found that problematic. And why don't I understand this research? Or what does this mean? And so forth. So that basically, yeah. um, right, sparked an interest in then exploring right. um, PhD programs. And that's what set my path. Yeah, into academia. Okay. And so I mean, you uh, mentioned the heritage speakers, right? And, um, you know, there's, um, yeah, our mutual friend had a, um, who mentioned something about heritage speakers, and he said, you know, sometimes they will learn, like, um, Calvin le gusta a correr, but a heritage speaker will drop the a, right? And so when you're teaching the, but, you know, from my perspective, language is more dynamic, right? So if, if language is dynamic and more of the heritage speakers drop the a, doesn't that become the correct grammatical way? So how do you how do you create a curriculum that still respects the di the dynamic nature of language, mm -hmm. but also adhere to the grammatical you know standards? Like where where do you draw a line? How do you differentiate? How do you create a curriculum that respects these things? 
So that's an excellent question um, and a very difficult one, which we have right many debates in the field. Um, I'm, I, I'm an applied link. I'm an, uh, an acquisitionist, so I'm interested very much in. I'm very interested in language learning, um, and that's what most of my work um, does. And it sometimes gets misinterpreted as me trying to suggest that heritage speakers should be speaking a certain way, right? And I and I don't agree with that, right? I think that the way people use language in their community, they are communicating. They are um, using different linguistic resources, whether that's mixing their English and Spanish or English and Korean to speak and right. Or now we're even using emojis to communicate. Right. <laughs> so all of these resources are available to us in order to express meaning and to communicate right information. So I, I think there is no need and um, to change that. Um, and also realizing, right. As linguists, we know that language has changed. So you're, the use of dynamic that you're using is very appropriate um, because languages do go, um, um, do change, um, right? And it's a natural phenomena. Um, however, my work has been sent, um, focused on individuals who are heritage speakers who want to, for some reason, use Spanish in very um, different circumstances or different contexts, which may require a different register of the language. Um, so I think that's completely fine as well, right? So I am a heritage speaker of Spanish, and I became a Spanish teacher. So obviously, right, I need to understand and know, right, certain right. registers that are taught. Um, unfortunately, whether or not, right, we see, right, we see them as more prescriptivist, right types of grammars but that is the reality so uh, my research has focused on those individuals for whatever motivation they want to acquire some type of register in which they're writing in a certain context or speaking in a certain context and i think that's completely fine what in my line in the the heritage classes that we direct here at, at uc irvine i'm very careful when i train my um, graduate students that we're not trying to erase what they bring from home and we tell students that they should be embraced and they shouldn't change the way they speak. But if they want to change, um, I, I call it code switching ninjas, right? So they, you become, because <laughs> I do that, right? You become right. a code switching ninja. Right. And it's your switching registers or the way you use a language for a certain, um, given a certain context, and also based on your own agency on how you want to use language. So for me, my work has been on those students who want to major in Spanish, minor in Spanish. A lot of our students want to be um, teachers in dual immersion contexts. Um, and we have had students at UCI who come back or graduates who never took Spanish. And they express to us how they wish they had taken like formal Spanish classes because it was a real challenge for them when they had to teach Spanish in dual immersion contexts. And they were teaching, right, um, right um, different um, different concepts in Spanish, which they didn't have. So I think that's, that's important. So I think for me, it depends on the goals of the learner. Um, mm -hmm. And, but I feel like if you are a learner and you want to acquire whatever register, um, if you want to call it academic or whatever register you want right. to call, like you have the right to acquire that. So I push against people who say, oh no, they should speak whatever they want. Well, yeah, but you can acquire a certain register because when I publish a paper, I have to use a certain register, right? I cannot right. use any register when I text or I tweet or, right? right? There's a different register. So I think it's up to the student and to the learner. But but if you don't want that, for example, mm -hmm. then that's totally fine, right? You should, like, the way you speak is totally fine. And I'll, right. I'll end with this. Um, so in our program, right, we, we have these writing courses, which are students who basically want to major or complete one of our minors in our, lang in our program, Spanish program. But, you know, we have also, I've been brainstorming and thinking about intermediate level courses of Spanish where we have mm -hmm. speakers who are in those courses who are probably there to complete a requirement mm -hmm. or for whatever reason, but they don't necessarily want to major in Spanish. So what would be the goals for them, right? And maybe these type of prescriptivist varieties are not as urgent for them, depending on what is it that they want to use the language for. So kind of touching on that a little bit, right, where you talked about like the, the heritage speakers that want to acquire a certain level of proficiency. And so, I mean, do you ever get students who are like the other way where they, do you ever encounter heritage speakers who don't even want to speak their, their heritage language? And where do you think that comes from? Is there, and is that a ongoing problem? Do you see like, does that become a problem? Just kind of curious on your perspective on that. 
Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, so there is linguistic, um, what we call insecurity or shame um, that people bring, like heritage speakers bring with them. Um, because I call them traumas, right? Students, mm -hmm. right? For, so unlike second language learners who come in with a blank slate, there's no emotional connection to the language. Heritage speakers bring this uh, sometimes baggage with them, right? And language tends to be, right, um, interacts with that. Right. Um, so for whatever reasons, right? So you can have reasons where sometimes heritage speakers will go back to their country of origin, their family's right, country mm -hmm. of origin, and they are, you know, um, belittled for the way they speak, right? Mm -hmm. So that's right there, right? Like certain baggage. Um, um, in the United States, we know that there tends to be a lot of discrimination against people who speak other languages. So mm -hmm. it may be that I need to speak English. I don't want to speak Spanish because if I speak Spanish, I'm going to be seen in a certain way, right? So there's a lot of shame, a lot of, and I call it trauma. So I, I always say that in our program, in our writing course, we're doing linguistic therapy with the students, right? right? In order for them to be aware of all of these issues. So I think that is completely fine. I mean, I, well, it's not completely fine. It's, it's completely understandable, I should say, right. that they are bringing, right? Because it depends on their experience, right? And that experience certainly can vary where you have people who come in very proud of their mm -hmm. linguistic background. So I don't want to say that all heritage speakers have shame. Um, so one classic example is um, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, uh, <laughs> you know, or AOC as we yeah. call her, right? I love that she uses Spanish, she'll code switch, and she, and she has experience expressed like she needs to work on her Spanish but she doesn't care she will use her Spanish to communicate and I always say I want all my heritage learners to be that right, <laughs> um, right. So, right? and so forth so um, it, so that I think um, has to do a lot with it um, and we need to um, work with that the other thing I would say and this might not be a popular answer given the work I do because I am obviously interested in promoting and the sustainability of heritage languages is that you know certain people don't feel a linguistic connection that they don't feel that they need to speak Spanish in order to consider themselves Latino Latina Latinx whatever term right you they mm -hmm. want to use as part of their identity so we know that and read this has been research that Latinx individuals do not see speaking Spanish many times as critical to their identities um, mm -hmm. and I feel that's also okay Right. So being bilingual, I, I think we tend to be sometimes very bilingual happy. And um, but being bilingual does not preclude you um, from being a not nice person. Right? right. Or you can be bilingual and racist. You can be bilingual and right? Right. So I, don't, I, I, I kind of push back against colleagues um, who um, try to sell bilingualism as this you know, solving all our yeah. problems and not necessarily. So I think, so I, I'm also respectful to those individuals um, as well. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I kind of want to get, like, I mean, that just peaked another question that I didn't have written. Um, you know, it, it, you say you want to be respectful to the, the colleagues who are pushing the bilingualism, but would you necessarily be opposed to, um, you know, making a second language, uh, like, you know, like mandatory for like UC students for graduation, like just any second language. So I want to be very clear. I am all for promoting bilingualism. There are certainly right benefits. So I, I want to be very clear that I am, uh, obviously the work I do is on um, sustainability, teaching, maintaining the heritage. Language. So obviously I am, um, I, I favor that. I, I guess am very careful about how these discourses right right, surround um, bilingualism. But no, I, I actually think that, right, learning a language, um, right, there are certain benefits and there's a lot of debates, right, on whether there are cognitive benefits associated with the bilingual experience and that's still being um, contested. There's some um, controversy around that. But I mean, it's not even about that, like learning another language to be able to communicate with your family, right? So if I know, you know, I've had heritage learners in my class where they don't have really they don't really have conversations with their families or their caregivers because they cannot communicate 
as well in the heritage language. I think that's complete, that's so sad, right? That you cannot communicate with your family and talk about certain topics because they don't have the linguistic resources to do that. So these are realities, right? Or that, you know, you, your grandparents live, you know, I'm from Puerto Rico, so I'll give an example, um, a Puerto Rican example that, you know, we, have, we are able to go back and forth to Puerto Rico easily. You know, you go back to Puerto Rico and you cannot speak to your grandparents or your great grandparents. So I think that's really, right a shame and and you know such a sad situation so yeah i feel yeah so i am all about promoting bilingualism um um in order to maintain those family ties to be able to communicate um you know the different perspectives you can gain um when we learn another language obviously we're learning about another culture um and it makes us be aware of our own culture so there are all these benefits so obviously i do promote Right. right. Um, um, languages. And I feel that if you are getting an education, um, I think, you know, being being exposed to another language and knowing about other literatures, other cultures is should be critical as part of your overall education. Right. I mean, you know, just side note for the listeners, uh, my significant other is a bio major, but they took all uh, they took a bunch of French courses mm-hmm. and their, their bio grades drastically improved i think it's mm-hmm. i think I, i'd give a little credit to the french you know stimulating part of the brain Absolutely. But, you know uh there was a question that i that i wanted to ask you this one's a big question so you know take a deep breath because i know it's gonna okay. be <laughs> i'm getting ready um, for it. <laughs> so what in your opinion what's the best way to learn a language Okay, that is a big question. <laughs> how much time do we have? How many episodes are we doing? Now? We, we, uh, I, I, we've got all the time you want. <laughs> um, I'm not all day. Yeah, so I think obviously you need to be the basic, basic, right? You need to be exposed to the language. You, what we, we need is input, right? Obviously, right. Um, in the language and to process that input. Um, I think I would say that... Um, so, so you need to seek these opportunities, right? To, to so when people tell me how, what do, what should I do? What program do you recommend? I'm like, just get a hold of anything, right? And start mm-hmm. somewhere. Um, even we have now research um, colleagues who are researching the effects of apps, right? Of mm-hmm. certain language apps on how they, and we're seeing some evidence that some learning is occurring, right? Um, in terms of vocabulary development, perhaps certain grammatical constructions. Um, but I think for me, um, so. But one key component is the interaction piece, right? Interacting with people in using the language, producing the language um, is also critical. Um, and when you're interacting, especially with a more proficient interlocutor, um, that provides you with certain opportunities for learning um, that, mm-hmm. that emerge as the conversation is happening, that emerges as you're trying to express meaning. And I think that's very important um, that we are using language. It becomes more relevant if you're you're using language in an authentic way and getting that feedback so right so feedback is crucial we know that it plays a good a critical role in helping us develop language and that can occur during during interaction right mm-hmm. um so yeah so i would say yeah you need to get a hold of exposure to language uh um, input i should say um and yeah, trying to seeking those opportunities to interact. Of course, it also depends on what are the goals of the learner. So I often say mm-hmm. this, like, you know, are you learning a language just because you only want to read in a mm-hmm. second language, right? So for example, PhD students sometimes have to learn another, they need, they need to be able to read another language and test out as part of their doctoral programs, right? So that's a different goal. Maybe that person doesn't need to interact as much, right? right. Um, with individuals, like, um, and they're going to focus more on reading, um, perhaps learning um, grammar rules, um, right? So I think um, I would say to answer that is the it's linked to the goals of the learner and based mm-hmm. on those goals, right, then how do we create instruction that's efficient and effective for that person to meet um, his or her goals? Okay. And so, I mean, building on that and the heritage speakers, right, we know heritage speakers have a wide, wide variety, right? They, they could be like uh, masterfully proficient to barely capable of interacting, right? And so, but they're still all in that same category. So then how would you design a curriculum to serve each of their needs when each of their needs is so individualistic? You know, like, because in a classroom setting, it's kind of hard 
from from what I understand, it's hard to, especially uh, in your classrooms. I'm sure there are like a few hundred students, like every other uh, you know department. How how do you do? How are you able to serve each of these students according to their needs? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's a good question. Um, so yeah, it is a big challenge. Um, I, I'm not sure if I have the right answers, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're, um, at least with heritage learners, we're still doing a lot of research to understand mm-hmm. their, um, um, their learning process, right? Um, so, but I would say the following. So it's a really good question. Even when, even in situations, for example, in our um, language department, right, we have a placement test um, to place students accordingly to, um, especially the heritage speakers, to place them, right? Um, in different courses and even so right it's not it doesn't mean that everyone got a 42 it doesn't mean that everyone is homogeneous right Um, Right. even if they get the same score Um, so what I think is is kind of rethinking how we teach language and especially we're talking about grammar instruction Um, so I would say number one I'm going back to the goals I'm big about goals right so why are students there you need to assess the needs of your students their goals for right? I'm taking certain courses. But then how, because of this heterogeneous, right, um, they're along a continuum. Um, And especially when it comes to specific linguistic structures, right, they can vary. Um, In fact, even the type of activity you can do, whether it's a written or speaking activity can elicit a structure or not. And we have evidence for that, right? So um, I think for me, at least in our program, our approach is we don't teach grammar a priori. So our syllabi are not designed by tomorrow, but on Tuesday, the 25th, everyone's going to learn double object pronouns on Thursday. So which tends to be the case, right, with second language um, <laughs> instruction. Um, so we don't do that. And we teach grammar at the end, right? We teach grammar as a result of what emerges in their writing, in their speaking, mm. right? And importantly, grammar that's going to help them that's going to help them support them or help them to communicate what they're trying to communicate. Because at the end, what we want students is to communicate, right, um, in the language. So uh, for heritage learners, I think it's critical um, to, to do these um, to type of instruction afterwards. So for example, in our program, our courses, which are in writing, we have days um, in the syllabi, what we call grammar boot camps, right? <laughs> um, and these days, there are no topics. Like the instructor decides on the topic depending on the needs of the students in the class. Because I can have a group that had completely different needs than Mm -hmm. another group, right? So my group can probably have had more issues on orthography, accent placement, right? Um, Those types of things. Um, So I'm not going to be concerned by certain verbal, complex verbal constructions, right? For that group. Because, you know, there's certain, th- again, what is it that they need to communicate effectively? So, but then another instructor can have a different group that other things emerge. So I think one strategy is, def- is definitely to do it that way. I think it has become more um, productive, I feel, mm-hmm. um, doing it that way. But again, we still are, in fact, one of my next research projects with a colleague is looking at that, looking at the timing of what we call explicit instruction, which is explaining to learners how to use a t- uh, type of grammatical construction. So we're looking at the timing between a communicative task that they would complete, whether it's more beneficial to do it before or after. For me, my, my world, it makes sense to do it afterwards, because again, what you have accurately yeah. stated there's a lot of variability right in this population mm-hmm. so um do it that way but we want to we're trying to look at what what are effective ways of introducing that grammar instruction okay. and you know on, on that same token the um the instruction for uh what's it called i well actually i'm gonna have to go back a little bit um you know our mutual friend did mention that you teach in mexico in the summers Right. And so I'm kind of curious on what your experience is, how your experiences teaching in Mexico differ from your teaching experiences in the U.S. And, you know, what, you know, what do you teach there as opposed to here? And how are you able to manage that? Because that sounds like, you know, two different cultures. If you're creating an individualized learning environment, it's got to be even more difficult in an entirely different culture, I would imagine. Well, yeah, so I, I do teach in Mexico, but part of the, the program that I teach is a graduate program, though, 
um, through um, Southern Oregon University, though. And this okay. is, um, they have a program in the, at the University of Guanajuato in Mexico, which is a beautiful place. And I feel so lucky that I get to go there um, during the summers. Um, but these are teachers who are K-12 teachers in the United States. Or I, we also have mm-hmm. um, instructors from community colleges that are getting a master's in Spanish teaching. So I'm mm-hmm. not really teaching, I'm not sure if you're getting out whether or not I'm teaching like natives from Mexico, right? Um, there might be students who are of Mexican descent, absolutely, um, in the classes, but it, so it is a different type of teaching for teachers. So it mm-hmm. does require um, me to think differently, um, right? On how um, to work with teachers and what type of, right? How to how they can reflect on their own teaching practices. So I'm very, I'm, I, I'm very big on not telling teachers what to do in their classrooms. I often tell right. teachers, you are all the experts in your local setting. I cannot tell you what to do. What I can show you is this is what the research is showing. And then how you implement that in your context, right, is up to you as the expert in your context. I don't believe in researchers telling teachers what to do. Um, so it's, it's such, um, it's, so gratifying because I am a former teacher. I taught high school for six years. Um, um, so for me, it's such a gratifying experience. So it is different in the sense that it's a different population. It's an intensive program during the summer. We are in Mexico. So how do we use the resources that we have in the environment? Um, but culturally, it's not different, right? Because mm. right, most of the teachers, basically all of them are, are from the okay. United States. And- Okay, and then I wanted to take a step back because this question occurred to me and then I uh, didn't get a chance to write it. Um, you know, you were mentioning that there was learning uh, occurring in the app-based, um, you know, with, with apps and whatnot. And so what are your feelings about, like, people communicating with, like, Google Translate? Because for my, I, I can just say from my personal experience, because I have family from Guadalajara and I have difficulty communicating because I have two years of high school Spanish, not much more. It's, I've been using Google Translate, but I don't feel like I'm acquiring anything by using that. I'm, yeah. only, I'm just, I'm, ba- I'm struggling to barely communicate. Yeah. So, I mean. So, so yeah, that's a good question. I mean, that's uh, a lot of debate <laughs> around Google <laughs> Translate and whether or not we use our students. So first of all, I want to say Google Translate has gotten a lot better over the years <laughs> of how accurate they're getting. Um, I think it's phenomenal, right? I think it's a great tool. Um, I know, I I haven't used it myself, um, but I know um, friends who have traveled to different countries and they're communicating with their Uber driver or their, you know, or taxi driver with Google Translate and they're able to write at least with some instructions. So I am, so from that perspective, great, like, Go Google right. Translate, right? <laughs> uh, you are. I will give another instance where people are using it, and this has happened in my own family. People, um, family members who are sick and need some type of therapy, and unfortunately, no one is able to be at the house at a certain time to interpret for them. Um, they have used Google Translate therapists to communicate with them, mm-hmm. right? Um, so I think, again, that's really, I think, great, right? Especially because it has gotten a lot better. Um, the mm-hmm. question, the more difficult question is, how do we allow, do we allow students to use this in classes, right? <laughs> and that's more of a debate um, as far as like, do they use Google Translate in the classroom and so forth? And that, we're, we're not too sure how, how to handle that. <laughs> I am of the belief, and may, people might disagree with me, that it's there, Let's use it. Um, but how do we use it, right? Um, but I, I, I'm not, I don't push back from students using Google Translate, right? It's there as um, technology. So I think how do we probably integrate it mm-hmm. into, because technology is advancing technology, right? So w- we should be embracing it. I don't feel we should be fighting it. But I think though we need to Think about carefully how do we integrate it in our classes and for our students to use it as a tool, right? But knowing that the goal should be for them also, right, um, to learn um, the language. So yeah, that that that's still a tricky subject. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. And okay. This is kind of more of a personal question. So, and um, my my experience with linguistics is literally limited to a brief conversation I got to have with uh, Dr. Kroll last year mm-hmm. and uh, Noam Chomsky, mm-hmm. who oh, wow. amazingly famous, right? 
or it's pretty, um, mm-hmm. how do you feel about Noam Chomsky? Uh, what are your thoughts on him? What are your thoughts on his views on linguistics? Okay, this is where I might get into trouble. <laughs> 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 um, so yeah, so I so I think obviously he's an intellectual, right? Come on, mm-hmm. I, he obviously revolutionized. You know, when, if we think about the cognitive, if, I don't know if I want to call it revolution, right? But the cognitive trend, right? We right. owe a lot to him, um, right? Where we as you know that transition from behaviorism, right? Skinner, we think about <laughs> Pavlov's dogs and all that, right? So. Right. Um, so yeah, so he has definitely made contributions um, um, to the field of linguistics, um, right? And we know not only in the field of linguistics, such an intellectual that making contributions in politics, right? And, right. and so forth. Um, although I sometimes am um, surprised that his politics and what he's done in linguistics don't really mesh, right? <laughs> um, and, and so forth. So I would say, so yeah, so he, there is a contribution, right? There is what we call generative linguistics that has contributed, obviously, um, to the field of linguistics in general. However, there are some limitations, right? Um, Those of us who might not really um, endorse um, this Mm -hmm. approach um, to to linguistics is kind of, I feel there are certain limitations as far as, first of all, there's been such a focus um, on monolingual native speakers, Right, so um, this I, and that has unfortunately made an impact in many um, mm. of fields of linguistics. In, for example, in my field, of heritage speakers, um, there, there, there's been has been colleagues who have raised concerns, which rightly so, and I agree with them, of comparing heritage speakers who are bilingual speakers to monolingual native speakers, right? And mm. whether or not that's a fair comparison. Now, my colleagues, right, who do formal linguistics, colleagues, by the way, I must say that I respect enormously, right, um, right have said, well, I'm inter- we're interested to see how language works in itself, right, right? Um, mm-hmm. and how grammar. But I think it's dangerous um, the, you know, what type of implications that a type of research program can have, because at the end of the day, at least for me, like I'm doing research to transform society, to transform thinking, right? Um, and that's social benefit of research. Um, so I think it, 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 it's, there's some criticism, right? Um, as far as like what that type of program has done or the limitations from it. Right, that language is not, we're not only these computer or doing math, basically, right? And there's a lot more to language than that. Um, How do social interactions, right, really contribute to those types of things? How the usage of the language compared to them? So uh, I want to say there have been really strong contributions that have made us think differently. And I think I'm very grateful for that. And again, in my field of heritage languages, right, colleagues who have done foundational work, right, in order for me to do my work about right language learning among heritage right. learners but i think also there have been certain unfortunately consequences of that as well right and, and then also on the um so it kind of sounds like noam Chomsky had some effects that were not wanted i guess on other fields um but you know Kind of talking on the heritage speakers, heritage speakers acquire the language from stay, from from home, generally speaking, right? Um, how, what's your view on how COVID nineteen is kind of kind of quarantined everyone, for lack of a better term? Mm-hmm. Obviously, it's not quarantined, it's sheltered, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. people are spending more time at home. So, is that reinforcing? Do you feel like that's going to reinforce the language acquisition for heritage speakers, or? because they're spending so much more time online, which is kind of dominated by an English sphere, are they losing a lot of their, the, the language acquisition because they're not interacting as much with their heritage language? I mean, what's your view on that? Well, so, that, so that's an interesting question because we have discussed, I've discussed this with colleagues. So it's an empirical question, right? We, right. we don't know exactly what have been the effects of being at home during this time during quarantine. Um, there are, I have read articles in which people are connecting with their family language, where ch- especially children, small children, who I feel are easier, are shifting a lot easier, perhaps than adolescents or adults, um, in which they are speaking more 
right? Um, right. The heritage language now that they're at home um, mm -hmm. with perhaps, if, let's say there's a grandparent, right? Or family member or whatsoever. Um, and I, I have, I know there's not any research that I can cite, but I know anecdotally from friends who have children who are bilingual and multilingual, they often tell me, yeah, now we're in Mexico and now she's speaking Spanish or, but now, or now we are in X with our family that speaks German and now she's speaking more German, right? So kids will adapt that easily. Um, so when we look at adolescence, and um, that's a good question. So I want to be careful to say that I don't want to make the assumption, which I think is going around that, oh, all heritage speakers are speaking the heritage language at home, right? Um, right? Right households differ enormously um right. family so this is what we call family language policies are very different um mm -hmm. across different households so um you can have um households where perhaps the parents are speaking in um, mandarin but the children the kids are responding in english right so they are hearing but they're not producing so right mm -hmm. so how much does that Right, um, influence, but we can also say that there are households where there are heritage speakers who are with their family, and there. This would have been the case in my in my case, right? If this was, mm -hmm. I was with my family, I would have been using more Spanish, right? At right. home. So the question is, um, how much of an impact does that have, right? Um, as far as sh whether or not I'm shifting dominance. And that's, again, I don't know whether, we don't have empirical evidence for that, but we've been curious about that. Whether there's going to be a shift in dominance if I am at home speaking only Spanish during this time, you know, it, it, because we're not also isolated. So we are interacting mm -hmm. with different individuals. Um, people might not be out and about like before, but you're still doing other things. Right. But again, you're perhaps using the heritage language more often. So, I, the question is, I don't know. We have, those of us in the field have asked this question and how do we measure that, mm. right? Because it can certainly have an impact on if there, let's say there are shifts for certain people in language dominance, right? Mm. Uh, how does that affect research that we're doing or questions that we are asking in the field? And, you know, talking about learning, um, you know, there was, this came to mind, there was a paper. I, I don't know if it might've actually been yours, um, where someone was changing the way they were grading language proficiency instead of requiring that, you know, instead of like, here's the test, you take the test and you're done, students would just demonstrate proficiency. And it, if at any point in the class they demonstrated proficiency, they got a check mark and like that added up to the percentage. And at the end, if they demonstrated pr proficiency in all these different things, then they got, you know, such and such grade. I mean, is that something that is becoming more common with language in linguistics with language professors and language acquisition or is that still kind of just such a novel concept that it's not a thing so I, i'm trying to understand your question so i get the premise of it but when yeah. you're talking about proficiency right so that i'm trying to unpack that um yeah. that they're checking boxes for so what do you right. mean so, so, so so, for example, a, a verb conjugation, right? Okay. okay. So they're okay. saying, okay, here you need to meet this metric, a, pre, a present tense, okay. present tense conjugation in the first person singular. Mm -hmm. Can they do it? And then if they get it, then it's like, you know, 1% for the class, you know, and then just at the end of the class, it all adds up. So you're talking about teaching, not research. Yes, yes, teaching. Um, so, yeah. Well, so does research, well... Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. No, that's okay. Yeah. Does research? <laughs> I'm trying does to research? Going to tackle this. Yeah. <laughs> does Does research bear out that that's actually a good way to teach, or does research demonstrate like maybe don't do that? So that's that's a good. So let me go to the research side. Um. So okay. there are different ways that we measure language, right? That we can measure right. proficiency. Um. It might be that there is a study that individuals are conducting to measure specific linguistic structures, right? right? So there are a number of tests and assessments that we use in order to achieve that goal to get a sense of the heritage, in, in this case, heritage bi bilinguals, right? right. Um, efficiency. Um, however, um, and this is something actually that I'm actually currently writing about, um, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily have ecological, what we call ecological um, validity in the classroom because we're not, doing those same type of things in the classroom or mm -hmm. the way you measure language in the classroom is not 
um, mm. in the same way. So a lot of the, for example, um, measurements that we use in research are not necessarily applicable in the classroom, right? So in my research, I, I try to use language tasks that are have more ecologically um, um, that are more ecologically valid in the classroom to elicit language production. And I feel in order to inform classroom instruction or even classroom assessment, we need to do that. So it doesn't mean, I wanna be clear that the research using other assessments are not valid, are necessary because they do shed light on grammar properties, right, of individuals and so on. So we needed that research. But I'm very concerned with colleagues who assume that based on those studies, we can immediately apply them in the classroom. And I'm like, wait, hold up, right? So <laughs> we need to take a moment here because the task, the assessment tasks that you were using are not the ones that teachers use in the classroom. So those studies are definitely informative, but we need to create, we need data right. um, from heritage learners engaging in pedagogic tasks, right? Um, and I'm here, I, I, I'm using task in a very broad, right? Um, yeah. person. Um, if there's a listener who knows about task-based language teaching, I don't necessarily mean only that. Um, so what type of activities they're doing? Because we know, like I said, I think earlier, that the, um, depending on the type of task or activity you do, it can elicit a different type of ling linguistic structures or information from heritage learners. So I think we need more studies looking at more ecologically valid classroom tasks and a list to see whether or not, right? And we can make certain predictions, right? And certainly we can make predictions based on these linguistic studies that have used other types of assessments, which are assessments for laboratory type of research, right? So we can probably make certain predictions. I think that's totally fine, but I think we need to confirm this in an ecologically valid manner in the classroom in order to really say with confidence, right? That these are the needs that these learners have. I hope that right. answered your question. Yeah. So I mean, it, it sounds, my takeaway from that, from that answer is that like these research, the, the, this research is informative. But it's not necessarily trans, it doesn't necessarily translate exactly. actual mm -hmm. positive outcomes if, yeah. unless we're very careful about it. Yeah. So I'm in my work because I'm interested in learning, classroom learning and instructive mm -hmm. right, settings. Um, I am very careful when I do a study like that, right? I, I, I use other all of those right. assessments too in my work. But when I want to look at learning, instructed learning, I, I'm careful of designing tasks that, that a teacher will be able to say, oh, I can relate to that because I can see that as an activity right. in the classroom that I do. Yeah. Okay. And um, there's, we, we don't have much time. Um, would it be okay? In the future, I, I'd love to follow up with you because this is such an interesting topic. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I love this topic, so I can talk yeah. about it. <laughs> um, but, you know, if students want to learn more, I mean, I always uh, close out with these two questions. Um, okay. So it's, if students want to learn more about you and your research, how can they? And the second question is, if students want to get involved in your research, is that possible? I know things may are kind of weird with COVID-19. And if it's possible, how can they? Okay. Oh, those are good questions. I'm glad you're ending with those. So, <laughs> so if you want to know about my research, I have a website, right? So mm -hmm. you can Google Julio Torres UC Irvine. And um, I have a, a, a page, right, um, where I, I have a list of my publications, um, information about my lab and research projects that we are working on. Um, and in the lab page, there is a link for to apply to work in, in the lab as a lab assistant. Um, and um, I've been doing this now for a, a number, two or three years. Um, and actually, I just sent out an email blast to our majors and minors. So I, I'm already getting applications to work in the lab in the fall, which will be virtual. So it, there's been a lot of work we've done during the summer to see how we run experiments virtually. So that's been a, a, a quite <laughs> an endeavor, <laughs> but we're getting there. Um, so yeah, um, that would be, and, and for, D, for working in the lab, very important my um, in language science. So I, my main appointment is in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, but I'm also affiliated with, um, in the Department of Language Science. Um, so um, in language science, we have a course called where students enroll and they get credit um, for mm -hmm. working in the lab, which I think is great. So you're getting research experience with a researcher and getting also 
um, credit. Um, I will say, however, that um, my lab is not the only one in, at UC Irvine mm -hmm. um, in which we do um, bilingualism research. So there are three other colleagues, um, my colleague Judith Crow, obviously you mentioned her, um, so you're yeah. familiar with her work, um, um, my um, colleague Elizabeth Peña in the School of Education, and also my colleague Gregory Scantra. So we all um, have labs and we all work um, with um, on bilingualism, right? Different angles, different perspectives. So what's exciting about UC Irvine at this moment, right, because this has emerged in the last mm -hmm. year or two, is that there are such ample opportunities to engage with um, bilingualism research on campus. So yeah. Awesome. And uh, are there any requirements for the students who want to apply? Um, no, I, I thought about that. And no, there aren't really any. Um, I would say I do have a list of criteria. What are the expectations, right? So mm -hmm. I would say, you know, making sure that you agree to those expectations when you're coming to work in the mm -hmm. lab. Um, but I really, there, yeah, there's no, I mean, I think about myself, if I were to go for the first time to work at a lab, like, um, you know, what would, so no, I, I, there aren't, I mean, if you have some type of linguistic b b background, that would be right. Awesome. Right. But not, not necessarily is um, people just come because a lot of students come to the lab because they're bilingual themselves. Mm -hmm. They have this experience and they want to understand. They've told me I, I'm here because I really want to understand my own bilingual right. experience and I relate to this research. So that's um, a, a motivation. So, yeah, for me, there's there are no specific qualification mm -hmm. or requirements, I should say. Okay, awesome. Uh, thank you for doing this, Dr. Julio Torres, everyone uh, from UCI. Thank you. It was an honor. Really. Oh, thank you. Thank you.